Um, but okay, let's let's do this. This guy's name is Miles Power. If you don't know him, he is a full time chemist. I freaking love his stuff. Um, he does like debunks of quack science and stuff. I love his stuff. I've watched him for a long time. He uploads pretty rarely because he has a full time job as a chemist, but um, he's recently been doing like debunks of like Holocaust deniers and stuff. So it's it's thoroughly entertaining uh, to see him break this stuff down. And this one is a conspiracy uh, theory related to the Titanic that some people have, which is kind of wacky. But I mean, you'll see him pitch it and then he'll explain why it doesn't make any sense. So here we go. Look at that. In Beauty. the early hours of April 15th, the British passenger liner RMS Titanic, owned by the White Star Line, collided with an iceberg on her maiden voyage from Southampton to New York City. At the time, some believed the ship to be practically unsinkable because of her system of watertight compartments of which four could be flooded and she would still remain afloat. However, the iceberg tore a series of holes along the side of the hull, flooding six compartments which sealed the ship's fate. Less than three hours after the collision, Titanic lay at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. Or did it? <laughs> there is a rather interesting conspiracy out there that states that Titanic was actually swapped with her sister, Olympic, and that she was purposely sank as a part of an insurance scam. Oh yes. And I've met many people that unironically believe this, okay? So... They're going to break this down and explain how some people think that it was sunk intentionally as part of an insurance scam. Hello there, Internet. It's Miles here. Now, as I've previously said, no event of any significance takes place in the world without generating a flutter of conspiracy speculation. And Titanic, one of the most iconic ships ever to sail, with its tragedy known worldwide, is no exception. Some believe that it was sank not by an iceberg, but by a torpedo from a German submarine. Other I've heard that one too, yeah. I'm pretty sure my brother, one of my brothers, thinks that that's what happened. And this is my favorite, by the way, believe that a cursed mummy that the Titanic was carrying is responsible for the collision. According to folklore, the artifact which acquired the popular nickname, the unlucky mummy, has brought nothing but misfortune to those who come into contact with it. Uh, funnily enough, there's, you know, if you ever saw the movie Titanic, there's the lady, um, Molly Brown. She's played by that lady. She did uh, Kathy Bates. That's her name. She's played by Kathy Bates. Um, and the character's nickname is the unsinkable Molly Brown. But she was just kind of like a rambunctious, bombastic socialite who was very wealthy. Didn't really fit in well with the other wealthy passengers. But she survived and um, lived out the rest of her days. I think she ended up dying broke, though. But she was actually like a Denver native. So she is actually uh, from Colorado and there is a uh, whole museum in Denver, Colorado dedicated to the unsinkable Molly Brown. You can go visit her house, um, which is kind of cool. I've never done it, but I've always wanted to. 1912 German torpedo. Yep. Yep. People think this stuff doesn't matter if it doesn't really make sense. I mean, you'll start to hear like, the common thread with all these conspiracy theories is just that somebody thought, maybe, and then that's it. <laughs> There's, like, no evidence. It's just, maybe, I thought that this could happen, and then that's all they've got. However, the British Museum say not only is there no truth to this, but rather than resting at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean, the unlucky mummy, which actually isn't a mummy at all, is currently on display in their Egyptian section. But by far the most popular... Yeah, like that whole thing. People think that it proves Egyptian curses. I saw a TikTok from a guy who thinks that this like confirms that mummies can carry curses. It's like, no, it's for one, it's not a mummy and it's not even like with the ship. It didn't go down with it. Like it wasn't even on it. It's like, what are you talking about? It's just like people make stuff up and they're like, that good enough. <laughs> the conspiracy out there regarding the Titanic comes from this chap here, Robin Gardner and his book, 
Titanic, the ship that never sank, where he theorizes, as I said at the beginning, that Titanic was actually swapped with Olympic and that she was purposely sank as an insurance scam. To say reading the book is tedious would be a huge understatement. It is quite possibly one of the most boring conspiracy books I've ever read. Now the reason for that is because it is mostly filler. Only a very small percentage of this book is actually dedicated to the actual conspiracy. And I think that's to hide the fact that there isn't hardly any evidence for this conspiracy. To show you how boring it is, look, look at this. There's an entire page dedicated to the provisions on board the Titanic, which has nothing to do with the conspiracy. 800 cases shelled walnuts, Titanic. Yes. 3,000 dozen fresh eggs, Titanic. Yes. It's all Titanic, this. All Titanic. The book theorizes that a switch took place after Olympic was damaged in 1911 when it collided with the HMS Hawk. The collision happened as the two ships were sailing parallel to one another, when, according to the subsequent Royal Navy inquiry, the Hawk was pulled towards Olympic due to her large displacement. The Hawk's bow, which was designed to sink ships by ramming into them, punctured Olympic's starboard side, both above and below the water, flooding two of her watertight compartments and twisting her propeller shaft. Engineers spent two weeks patching her up before she limped back to Belfast for further repairs. According to the book, this is where it was discovered that the damage to Olympic was actually far greater than anyone imagined. Apparently her keel had been warped, giving her a constant list, and the repairs necessary to correct this would be totally uneconomical. Now by this time, she'd only made four journeys to and from Southampton to New York, so the White Star Line were facing, at least according to the book, a massive loss here. It was at this time that a plan was hatched to not only replace Olympic with a fully working ship, but also to claim the insurance of a brand new ship. Now all they had to do was swap Olympic with her sister ship Titanic, stage an accident and sink her, and then claim on the insurance. Genius. Easy. Olympic and Titanic are almost identical, with the majority of objects being standard White Star issue. The very few items that bore the name of the ship they were on, like lifeboats, bells, and nameplates, according to the book could easily be removed and swapped with one another. Once the swap was complete, the plan was then to sink Olympic disguised as Titanic on the way from Southampton to New York. Close to the site chosen to stage the accident was the SS Californian, who was tasked with picking up survivors. However, whilst faking the sinking of Olympic disguised as Titanic, apparently they accidentally sank her. Oops. That's quite a fail really. So, according to the book, and this is where it gets a little bit confusing, uh, there was another ship involved. So we have Olympic disguised as Titanic, we have the Californian that has just ran the road, and then we have a third ship, a smaller ship, that apparently crashed into the Olympic. It wasn't an iceberg, it was this third smaller <laughs> ship. Now, it went off limping away, and it fired its distress rockets. Now, the Californian that was tasked with picking up survivors saw these distress ro rockets and was a little confused and was like, oh, what's going on here? And then that's why it didn't come to the help of the Olympic disguises as the Titanic. This is just a massive mess. But apparently... See how, like, it starts with, they have an idea. What if? the the titanic was actually the olympic and it was intentionally sunk as part of an insurance scam then they're like oh that sounds awesome that could totally be what it was and then they start to look into it and they're like okay well then so like did they intend to kill like 1200 people did they want to do that was that part of it and it's like no 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 they were going to get everybody off there was going to be a ship nearby to help save everybody and then they would just collect on the insurance but then they made an oopsie and another ship crashed into the titanic which ended up sinking it faster than intended so the california that was supposed to rescue everybody but accidentally they went to the wrong ship and rescued those guys which left everybody else on the titanic to die and drown so big oopsie big misunderstanding you know <laughs> <laughs> I would have gotten away with it too if it weren't for that damned little skipper that ran into me. It just starts with one idea. And then like when a, like a normal well-adjusted person should look at it and be like, okay, you know what? This just doesn't make sense. I guess that's not true. These types of people double down on it. And are like, nope, definitely what happened. Definitely what happened. And we just We just can't see the truth of it. It's such a great conspiracy. 
that they, they've taken into consideration all of this. And they want it to sound a little crazy so that if you believe it and you figure it out, then you sound crazy. The, the fact it sounds crazy is actually evidence that it's true. Which is also something I've heard people say. Reminds me of people on my Instagram. <laughs> you know, there's a block button. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, we really need a Luke's monthly conspiracy theory hour. Uh, dude, I'd be down. There's so much insane stuff out there. It's ridiculous. Um, I have a whole interactive pop-up book on the Titanic from when I was younger. It's my favorite. I, I had one like that too. I, I just find it fascinating. I don't know. It's it, I, I described it like last week. Somebody asked me why I like the Titanic. And I was like, I, I see it as really a monument to man uh, or, or to man's arrogance and bravado and how they like it's sort of like the modern tower of babel like you know it's it's an example of man thinking that they're better than maybe they are you know thinking that the ship is unsinkable so they don't take proper precautions and provide enough lifeboats you know the, the arrogance of man i find it fascinating the that's what happened according to the book Don't they see us? No, sir. There was a light flashing, but it must have come from their masthead. This conclusion, however, didn't make it into the documentary based on the book, Titanic The Shocking Truth. I am just burning my money here, aren't I? Anyway, according to the documentary, everything conspiracy-wise is the same up until the collision. Now, the documentary says, yes, indeed, it did hit an iceberg. But there was some confusion with the Californian, who was actually there to pick up survivors. It saw another ship that was in distress that it doesn't go into detail what ship it was, but apparently this is where all the confusion happened and why the Californian didn't come to rescue people on the Titanic. Looked like a rocket, sir. Yes. I wonder what a ship like that would want a fire rocket for. Technical issues make the documentary <laughs> almost unwatchable, and despite being less than an hour long, I really struggled to make it to the end a lot like the book. Now, it's not helped by the fact that, and this is going to sound really mean, the narrator, Peter Willis, looks... He's an interesting looking gentleman, and to quote my good mate James Gurney, he thinks he looks like an alien wearing a human mask. Titanic cost ten million dollars <laughs> to build, so mean. and as a brand new ship would have been insurable for that amount and more. The Olympic, on the other hand, damaged beyond economic repair, would only have been insurable for a much smaller amount. A motive for switching the ships is clear. Bitchiness aside, there's no <laughs> sugar water, Edgar. <laughs> Another thing that you might have noticed in that clip I showed you right there, the audio has all been dubbed over. Now, presumably they had massive issues with their audio, so they had to get Peter Willis back in the studio. But those things combined, his unusual features and this kind of off audio, it has this really uncanny valley kind of esque to it. Is it just me who thinks that? Am I just a horrible person? For all its failings, the documentary does actually a pretty decent job at presenting the evidence put forward by the book that a switch actually took place. Now, some of this evidence is, I'm not gonna lie, pretty piss poor, but I've decided to go after what I consider to be the five strongest pieces of evidence, and I'm gonna debunk them all. So let's start off with number five. Five. Olympic and Titanic were practically identical. So, according to both the book and the documentary, Titanic and Olympic were identical, and therefore a switch would have been easy, because all you have to do is take a few lifeboats, a few plates, a few bells, and just swap them over. In fact, you could have done it in, and I kid you not, in a weekend, according to the documentary. Switching the two ships would have been a remarkably simple undertaking. There were no members of the press poking around or roving TV crews looking for a story. Even photography was in its infancy at the time. And generally, people believed what they were told to be the truth. All crockery, linen and so on was White Star standard issue, interchangeable from ship to ship. Letterheads and menus, etc. were styled to the particular ship, but could easily have been changed. Only the names on the bows and sterns of the ships, the nameplates on the lifeboats and 48 life belts would have to be swapped. This could easily have been achieved using a very small crew, literally over a weekend. And it's highly unlikely that anyone would have noticed a switch when they returned to work on Monday morning. At first glance, Olympic and Titanic seem identical. After all, they were constructed from the same set of plans. 
However, a number of improvements were made to Titanic during Olympics construction and after her maiden voyage. Many of these differences were structural, meaning that any switch would have to be extensive, time-consuming and very expensive. For example, the forward half of A deck on Titanic was enclosed with glass screens, whereas Olympics deck was open. The two ships also have very different spacing between their windows on B-Deck, which also on Titanic go back further. B-Deck internally was also drastically different on both ships, with Olympic having a promenade whereas Titanic had rooms that were flush to the side of the ship. As I said, the documentary says that the switch could be done using a handful of men over a couple of days, but to give credit where credit is due, the book actually acknowledges that major changes will be needed. Yeah. Quite different. People would probably notice, <clears throat> especially if they were paying a lot to stay on the new fancy ship, you know? What are we watching? Uh, John Marco, this is a documentary or a quick little debunk of a documentary claiming that the Titanic whole thing was faked because we're building the Titanic. It only seemed appropriate. Um, uh, maybe it was all manufactured so that Luke could make content out of watching it while building Legos. That, I mean, that makes sense. It's, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> Didn't they both sink? No. Uh, so Olympic crashed uh, or was rammed and then went to be repaired. And then after that, I believe the Olympic ended up being used in World War One as like uh, a uh, like medic ship. It basically went and carried wounded soldiers uh, from battlefields and then brought them back uh, to London or wherever they were going. So. Um, it was like a medic transport ship during the war. And then after that, it had a good long life. And eventually, I think it was retired. Um, I mean, we could check where it ended up at the end of it. I didn't think that it, it ended up sinking, but maybe it did. Uh, post Titanic Strike 19, uh, Dacia's server. Post-war last year's retirement in 1934. The White Star Line merged with the Cunard Line at the instigation of the British government to form... Cunard White Star. This merger allowed funds to be granted for the completion of the future Queen Mary and Queen Elizabeth. When completed, these two new ships would handle the Cunard White Star's express service, so their fleet of older liners became redundant and were gradually retired. Olympic was withdrawn from the transit from tr the transatlantic service and left New York for the last time on April 5th, 1935, returning to Britain to be laid upon in Southampton. The new company considered using her for summer cruises for a short while, but this idea was abandoned and she was put up for sale among the potential buyers was a syndicate who proposed to turn her into floating hotel off the coast of France. But this, um, but this came to nothing after being laid upon for five months alongside her former rival. Um, let's see. She was sold to Sir Jarvis, Sir John Marvis for, or John Jarvis, member of parliament, uh, parliament for 97 Point five thousand to be partially demolished at Jero to provide work for the depressed region. Mm, let's see. Between 1935 and 1937, Olympic superstructure was demolished, and uh, then on the 19th of September 1937, her hull was towed to Toss W. Ward's maybe yard at Inverkeithing for final demolition, which was finished by late 1937 at that time the ship's chief engineer commented quote i could understand the necessity if the old lady had lost her efficiency but the engines are as sound as they ever were so it's kind of sad because it's like that's the ship on its way to be scrapped like it's still quite impressive but they were just massive steel ships and so they didn't have a lot of a lot of uh carry progress but i mean can you imagine if they had reserved or preserved this and then kept it as like a floating hotel with the discovery of titanic in the 80s it would have blown up it would have been the most popular spot and if they still had it out there i mean it would be crazy popular nowadays people would go there all the time um just to check it out because it's so similar but you know people forget the titanic sank they didn't know where it was until it was discovered in the 80s like it was just gone like it's at the bottom of the ocean somewhere like they didn't have gps they didn't have any of that stuff they knew roughly where it probably happened but they didn't know and it took a long time to find it um i saw an insane info to me on the titanic the amount of fuel needed for one run so i don't know the exact word. no you're fine um it's like 800 tons a day dude i believe it it's insane you know because the, nowadays these ships are very very efficient like um modern 
Cruise engines, yeah, like the modern stuff to get these engines working, to, to drive these ships are insane. You know, but back then these were all coal powered like boilers and stuff. Um, those huge aircraft carriers, they use nuclear energy. Like it's insane what they can do now, but back in the day, I mean, they were literally shoveling coal to keep it moving. Uh, which is pretty wild but anyway we'll let them finish going out these changes or how hard it would be to do or the number of people required to make these changes no it doesn't mention any of that because if it did it would just all fall apart oh yeah the violet jessup or the violet violet jessup yeah she survived the titanic and then the britannic <laughs> she just had bad luck i'm not traveling with her <laughs> she just knows how to pick them um yeah it's it's pretty insane she lived i mean quite the life gee whiz both the documentary and the book mention one thing that apparently those that were tasked with swapping the two ships over totally forgot about, and that is the number of portholes on each ship. On the forward part of Sea Deck, Olympic was built with 16 portholes. The Titanic with 14. Somewhat mysteriously, the Titanic has acquired two extra portholes between its launch and its maiden voyage. This clearly points to the possibility that the two ships were switched. At launch, Titanic did indeed only have 14 portholes on her port side, on sea deck. However, in December 1911, during her fit out, she had two added to light crew galleys and a washroom. What's interesting is that this time Olympic also only had 14 portholes. And it was not until March 1912, after the Titanic, that two additional portholes were added. See how like, he didn't lie when he was describing it. He's like, Olympic had 16. It's like, yes, she only got the 16 after the Titanic sank. So like, <laughs> it's, if anything, the Olympic, it looks like the Olympic was outfitted to look more like the Titanic. It doesn't like the other way around. But this is why you just have to be so careful with content online because so often it's just swapping around words or not telling you a piece of information that's important can cause the whole thing to fall apart because what he's saying is the olympic had 16 portholes uh right here and then the titanic when it left uh the construction yard had 14 but when it launched on its maiden voyage sometime between when it was done being built and when it took off for its maiden voyage it had gained two portholes oh my god and then he says that the Olympic had 60. Oh my God. So it looks like they swapped it. So the Olympic is actually the ship that took off on the Titanic's maiden voyage. But no, no, no. The, the Olympic only got 16 after the Titanic sank. So like, if anything, the Olympic was made to look more like the Titanic. It doesn't make sense. Um, Hence why... Could it not have just been a design choice? Though? Well, exactly. Like what they're saying is that they added two to the Titanic before they left because they needed extra light in crew galleys and stuff that were right down here on the front of the ship. So like, it's not a, a scandalous thing for the Titanic's engineers. So, like, yeah, we, we changed it around. We installed two extras cause we needed more light. Easy. Post Titanic sinking images of Olympic also have this 16 porthole configuration. Now this part of the conspiracy always confused me because I think they've missed a perfect opportunity here to convince people that a switch actually took place. Mm -hmm. I mean, for example, we know that Titanic had 16 portholes when she set sail from Southampton to New York. But just beforehand, Olympic only had 14. And it wasn't until after the sinking that you see Olympic with 16. So you should say that, hey, Titanic had 16, Olympic had 14, but then, whoa, after the switch, suddenly Olympic had 16. That's what you need to do. You've missed a brilliant opportunity there, documentary and book. Yeah, no, it's like they, they have a way more convincing conspiracy theory, uh, like little bullet point, but they go for the stupider one. <laughs> and it's so they're trying to say that the Titanic was made to look like the Olympic when the timelines don't match up, when all they have to say is, no, the Titanic was made to into the Olympic because you can see the 16 portholes are there and that the Olympic was outfitted with 16 before it left to look more like the Titanic after the fact. You know, so they just mix it up and they make it way worse. Um, will you go to new Titanic? They should start building it. It will be a modern ship. Look like Titanic. It's called Titanic. Look it up. Oh, really? 
I don't know. I'm not superstitious at all. So, like, I don't, I don't care. I would go on it. Nick and I have been looking at cruises and stuff. Um, but, like, yeah, I don't know. It, it feels weird to be, like, really celebratory about it because it's, like, a lot of people died. It's, like, you can go have a Titanic-themed wedding. You can go to, like, Southampton and, and have a wedding themed around the Titanic, which just seems weird to me. I don't know if I like that. So, I, I don't know. Um, it's meant to be doing the same route Titanic did, but in modern times. Hmm. I mean, I'm sure it'll be fine. Like they have, they have sonar, they have radar and stuff. They can detect uh, these things well beforehand. And now with GPS, you know, there's no way that these ships would, I mean, you saw the Costa Concordia, um, flip over on its side and other cruise ships have had major issues and stuff. And the only injuries and deaths that usually happen are with very elderly people that become, like, injured in the initial hit and then can't move. That's usually where we run into issues. Um, but I, I would agree, Bep. It, it feels tasteless because it just feels like, uh, I mean, a lot of people died. You know, a lot of people died. But I don't know. I don't know. I don't, I don't want to interest shame anybody. If you're really into the Titanic and you want to go on that route because it's kind of cool, like, okay. But um, it just, it feels weird to me. Titanic with two eyes. That's, that's amazing. That's, wow. It's like when they did um, uh, Red Faction Armageddon. Or red, or red Faction Gorilla, and then they did a remaster, but they called it the remastered version because <laughs> it's on Mars. You know, it's like, well, I mean, I get what you're doing. Maybe like, that's pretty stupid. <laughs> Look, that was pretty stupid. I think it's sad we no longer have any survivors left in the world. The last one passed away a few years ago. Yeah, and she was like a baby. I think she was an infant, um, like less than a year old on the ship, and then her mother carried her off. Um. But the last survivor that, like, actually was aware of it and could tell you what was going on died in, like, the early 2000s, I think it was. For keeping the swamp secret. So we all know that actors that star in low-budget documentaries are pretty much never going to win an Oscar anytime soon. However, there is a scene in Titanic The Shocking Truth that takes this bad acting and turns it up to 11. It's absolutely fantastic. Now, the scene takes place whilst the documentary awesome. is trying to describe how so many people could keep this secret secret. And it stars two guys, two Irish dock workers in a bar when one of them starts talking to the other one about how he knows the two ships have been swapped. Then suddenly this guy grabs him. And it's really, it is, it's, 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 it's just marvelous. You have to see it. There's a wee scam going on here. Wee scam. And the bosses are in on it. Tip of the morning to ya. It's me, Jack Skeptic Boy. I'm skeptical of this ship. This air ship, there there do be a swap uh, foot. There do be a swap in the foot. Mark me words. They switched those ships two weeks ago, and I know it. Listen to me, Paddy. Any more talk from you about two ships being swapped over, and you'll end up at the bottom of the River Lagan. So remember that when you get back to your wife and your 17 kids. You Irish scum. Do you see what I mean? It's just hilarious. That one guy that takes his role way, way too serious. <laughs> like, so bad. <laughs> it's so bad. Oh, man. Remember that when you go back to your wife and your 17 kids, you yeah, Irish, Irish scum. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine them reading the script and being like, okay... I, I, how am I going to act this? I know, completely over the top and ridiculous. That's how I'm going to act it. Now, looking past how ridiculously bad this acting is and how jarring this scene is with the rest of the documentary, are we really meant to believe that all the people involved kept this secret to their deathbed? Are we really meant to believe that? Because this is what the documentary and what the book is saying. Now, let's not forget, to make the changes between the two, would take a hell of a lot more than a handful of people and a couple of days. You're talking about hundreds, if not thousands of people to make the change. And let's also not forget that the launch of these two ships, Titanic, which was because of her weight, the biggest ship out there, had a lot of press coverage. So there are people 
who from the press who were monitoring all this? Did we keep them secret? What about the people who weren't affiliated with the shipbuilders or the White Star Line who just lived in Belfast and saw that, hey, why are they making one ship look like the other? Did we keep them secret as well? It, it's, it's lazy conspiracy 101. When people can't explain how so many people must be kept secret on a massive conspiracy, they just say they've all been paid off or they've all been threatened. It's laziness. And quite frankly, conspiracy theorists, you need to, you know, you need to up your game. Three. Titanic propeller was found at the shipwreck. So you're probably thinking, uh, what? So yeah, if Titanic sank, you'd expect to find her propeller at the shipwreck. Well, not according to the book and documentary. In order to get the Olympic back to sea and earning a profit as soon as possible, the starboard propeller, stamped with the Titanic's number 401 and not yet fitted to the Titanic, was fitted to the Olympic. This is a fact of some considerable significance, as we shall find out later. According to them, Olympic starboard propeller was badly damaged after the collision with the Hawk and needed replacing. When she arrived back at Belfast, all resources were pulled from Titanic in order to return her back to service as soon as possible. To speed up repairs, the decision was made to install a propeller on Olympic that originally was going to be for the Titanic. When the wreck of the Titanic was discovered in 1985, pictures were taken of her starboard propeller and revealed the Titanic's yard number, 401, on the blade. This was the same blade given to Olympic after the accident with the Hawk, and therefore the ship at the bottom of the ocean is not Titanic. Examination of the starboard propeller reveals the number 01 stamped into the metal. In fence, there is too much corrosion to make out the number 4 clearly, but remember the starboard propeller, numbered 401 for the Titanic, was put on the Olympic as part of the repairs after the collision with the Hawk. In reality, the collision with the Hawk damaged Olympic's propeller shaft and not her propeller. A replacement was taken from Titanic, allowing repairs to the Olympic to be finished within six weeks. It was a few months after the accident with the Hawk that Olympic damaged one of her propellers, which also needed to be replaced. However, this time they could not simply take Titanic's, as the two ships had different pitch propeller blades. Not that they would need to, because Olympic had spares, like Titanic. In fact, Titanic's spare propeller was turned into memorials. Two. Titanic, on her maiden voyage, was listing to port. According to the book and documentary, after the collision with the Hawk, Olympic was listing to port. And yeah, Golden Apple, right after this, I want to I wanna look that up. Um, because it, it's pretty insane how much it's already degraded. And I, ba I think, I don't remember what the official statement was, but my understanding is that they've basically said that the... Titanic is like now a memorial full stop. So they're not going to treat it as like, you can't go visit it. You certainly can't go and take items from it. Um, it's considered like a sacred place. You don't go there. Uh, so I don't think you can even like dive on it now um, with like robots or anything. I think it's, it's completely disallowed, but maybe I'm wrong on that. But I thought I remember I think I remember reading something about it. Um, and coincidentally, the ship that left Southampton that was meant to be the... T well, James Cameron's James Cameron. James Cameron does what James Cameron does. Not because it's easy, but because he is James Cameron. <laughs> Titanic on her maiden voyage was also listed to port. Now this is actually correct, and it's mentioned by survivors of the disaster and you can also see it in pictures taken of the ship leaving Southampton. It's not unusual for ships even today to have a slight list due to improper balancing. However, Olympic didn't have a list because her keel wasn't warped by the incident with the Hawk. And in fact, she operated for months after the incident with the Hawk and before Titanic's maiden voyage. Conspiracy theorists never talk about this or explain it. For the Switch conspiracy to work, you have to ignore the timing of events and the fact that Olympic was operating for months between her accident and before the damage to her propeller forced her back home to Belfast. It is here where the Switch apparently took place. Because up until this point, not only was Titanic not complete, but previous repairs to Olympic caused her maiden voyage to be delayed. So, if the accident with the Hawk damaged Olympic's keel so badly that she was unseaworthy, and the Titanic wouldn't be finished for a few months and wouldn't be seaworthy herself, 
What was making the journey to and from America and England? I don't know. One. That's just what they want you to think. <laughs> uh, banana brains. Glad you dropped in. Um, yeah, dude, I love Miles Power. <clears throat> I've watched him for years and years and years. In fact, the day before, no, it was the morning of my wedding when I was like stressed out and really anxious. And it's, you know, it's just, it's an exciting but stressful day. Uh, to chill out on my drive to the venue that morning, I listened to a bunch of Miles Power videos. I don't. I think that's the first time I've ever told anybody that. But yes, that's that is what I like. This is my re relaxation content. This is what I chill out to. Um, but yeah, he's got great uh, like videos on um, the Holocaust deniers. He's got great videos on the. Uh, he's done stuff on like Jilly Juice that crazy lady who thinks you can drink rotten cabbage water and regrow limbs. He's got great stuff. Really, if you've not subbed to him, you should go sub to him. It's thoroughly entertaining stuff. Let us fall off the shipwreck to reveal the name Olympic. Oh, this one's ridiculous. Okay. Right. This one has to be seen to be believed. Watch this. And finally, a close look at the bow could reveal the most damning evidence of all. In 1986, the French National Oceanographic Institute... No, not the night of the wedding. Not the night of the wedding. The morning of the wedding. I, when I woke up and I'm driving to the venue to get married. That's what I did. Not, I didn't get like back to the honeymoon suite and boot up Miles Power. <laughs> examined the wreck with Dr. Robert Ballard. One of the things they checked was the name of the ship. In keeping with White Star tradition, both ships had their names engraved into the upper bow plates in letters four foot high. Examination of the wreck and the name Titanic shows that it is made of iron letters which have been riveted onto the original bow plates. With the passage of time, two of the letters have dropped off and been lost forever in the sediment of the seabed. At the place where they once were, engraved into the hull, are the letters M, and P. <laughs> it's, I mean, yeah, who are they trying to kid? Who are they trying to kid with this really poor CGI? Even poor for the late 90s, early 2000s. I mean, they are fabricating evidence. They commissioned someone to make this for this documentary. Yeah, the whole I thing's mean, I made up. I know it's not unusual for conspiracy theorists to fabricate data, but bloody hell, usually they're a lot more competent at it than this. This is... Well, I, I know I say laughable quite a lot when I want to totally have a go at someone, but this yeah. is laughable as... It's just like the worst CGI you can imagine. And like, what's funny is all of the footage for all of this stuff is like public domain. Everybody has access to the full recordings from the, the trips down to the bottom of the ocean to visit Titanic's wreck. So you can see every second that they recorded. And you don't think that people could cross-reference that and see if that clip ever showed up? It doesn't. Because that clip was entirely CGI. Like they just straight up made up the whole thing. It's just ballsy. Like it's pretty, pretty amazing. The most famous wreck of all time. This is the bow of the Titanic still recognizable more than 100 years after she sank. It's the first time yeah, people have been down to see it. For the they visit after 15 years of not being down there, and then they see, like, they, they see some crazy stuff. No, this is Ziggy's. This is, like, a local Colorado one. They're starting to expand a lot. You'll probably start to see this uh, brand a lot more places because they're blowing up, but um, kind of like Dutch Bros, but I think the coffee's more consistent. It's not like really good one week and then horrible the next week. It's I've only ever had good experiences there themselves for nearly 15 years. But while some of the wreck is intact, other parts have disappeared altogether. Probably the most shocking area of deterioration was the starboard side of the officer's quarters where the captain's quarters are. The captain's bathtub is a favorite image among Titanic enthusiasts, and that's now gone. That whole deck house on that side is collapsing, taking with its staterooms, and that deterioration is going to continue advancing. 
Despite the near freezing temperatures this far down, life has found a way to thrive on the wreck. And that's causing the problems. Microbes are eating away at the metal. Stalactites of rust dangle from the ship, so fragile they crumble into a cloud of dust if disturbed. Amazingly, the portholes, though, are well preserved. The glass is still in place, even if all else around it is decaying, giving a tantalizing glimpse into the Titanic's past. It's crazy. It I mean, it looks like it's just melting. It's just doing it slowly over the course of a century. Like, it's wild. He took my thing! Red flag.